Shea Bradley. Okay, good evening, everyone. If we could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> okay, I'm going to need a motion, 1.4, to adopt tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll need a motion, 1.5, to approve the board meeting minutes of October 13th, 2021. I'll make that motion. Second. Is there any discussion or are there any issues with the draft? I had none. Nope. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Before we get going, the board would like to say thank you. When we came into our executive session, there was a giant spread there. It was from our foods class, right? Miss, Miss Besson's Advanced Foods. It was unbelievable. Good job. On the drive over, I was saying, oh, remember the board meeting when they had <laughs> spaghetti one time? And because the board, except to look at me, doesn't get to eat uh, usually <laughs> before a board meeting. And uh, I had that dream in my head that there would be uh, a giant spread. And there was, and it was amazing. We we're quite full. I know uh, some of us are more full than others. Uh, Ms. Besson and her students wanted to recognize the board. Last week was School Board Recognition Week, and uh, we're very grateful for everything that the board does, and that was a small way that our students could express their gratitude. It, it was excellent, so thank you to all the work that went into it. The presentation was amazing. I will often have my charcuterie board ready to go, but it was the best I've seen today. Okay, we're going to start tonight's meeting with presentations. And we're going to start tonight with Mr. Aguilar. Good evening, Mr. Sambitz, Mr. Petrolak, members of the Board of Education, our guest, as always, and most of all, our community. Uh, you have my board report. Again, we are at mid-season, if you can believe it or not. November is right around the corner. And usually around this time, uh, your Hamletonians are in uh, postseason play. Uh, in my report, I included regarding, uh, as we are back, football uh, currently ranked in the state number 13. And uh, they have an important game this weekend, as, uh, excuse me, Friday night, as it is senior night. Uh, they will take on Highland, and this will help them uh, position themselves for the playoff, for the postseason play. Boys soccer, congratulations to uh, Coach John Hogan and his staff and the members of the team as they have returned to the playoffs. It's been quite some time for the program being in the playoffs, and it was great. We had a great turnout. Uh, it was great to see our modified uh, soccer program there, our girls varsity program there in support, and faculty and staff. Uh, tough loss to a, a very good Rhinebeck team, um, but again, you know, for our program to be back in the playoffs and ranked, uh, excuse me, seated number two. So uh, that was great for our, our program again. Girls soccer concluded the season, um, but you know, I just want to just share with you the names that uh, you'll be hearing in the future. Uh, the one-two scoring punch of, uh, of the Thonis sisters, Hannah and Abigail as they were uh, the leading scorers for the team along with senior Caroline Farrell. Uh, and also, uh, remember this name, Stephanie Clark. She was on the JV uh, as the goalkeeper and did not allow any goals in three straight games, which is very difficult to do, but she was able to master it and we look forward to her success. Volleyball, uh, this week we find out uh, where the team uh, ends up in postseason play. Again, you know, this program, we continue to be successful as this is year seven. And now uh, we're going back into uh, the playoffs. As you can recall, last year we made it to the championship game for uh, 
C-Class. Uh, and, and one young lady that you need to keep in mind, uh, uh, again, is Skylar Dewhurst, uh, doing very well. And also, I want to recognize uh, Julie Malone and Trini Delgado. In my blue and orange notes, I uh, just wanted to share with you, uh, members of the boys' soccer team participated in the Warwick Beautiful uh, People program. That's a yearly event where our kids assist in the soccer clinic for uh, needy young students. Um, in our home football games, we've collected over 300 canned items, and that will go to uh, the Chester Food Bank. We will be delivering those soon. Um, also, we celebrated uh, the, last week our senior boys, girls, soccer, and volleyball senior night. Uh, we presented each student, uh, each player, excuse me, each senior, with a, a two by three poster and com a commemorative a photo as a keepsake. Um, if you saw online, we use that as copies as we've been working with a new software program. Uh, this weekend, uh, this Friday night, will be uh, boys football, where we will recognize them as senior night. Uh, Hambo's in the news. Uh, Trini Delgado for volleyball was re recently interviewed in the Chronicle. Uh, she was recognized for her leadership skills on and off the court. And if you saw on Facebook, Jake Laura, one of our senior football captains, was interviewed on the 845 Sports Nation podcast, and he looked really good uh, uh, in terms of speaking about not only about the school and, and James I. O'Neill, but also gave thanks to Coach Stover and spoke about the legacy of Chester football. And then I, I personally want to thank again Mr. Petrolak, Ms. O'Hare, the Board of Education. Um, as we've now switched to an online program, registering program, Family ID, which has really helped um, our department to streamline uh, families to sign up their children for athletics at this time. Uh, we've been up and running for about a week and a half, and we've already had close to 40 students already signed up. This is going to save a lot of time in uh, the athletic department office. Uh, both myself, uh, uh, Gina Straub, our school nurse, and also our coaches as they're going to be able to carry uh, the information with them on their phone, especially the emergency contacts. So thank you again. Thank that you concludes very my report. report. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Aguilar? Comments? Thank you for a very thorough report, yeah. sir. Thank you again. Very good stuff. Thank you. Matt, Mr. DeRossi. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Sambich, Mr. Petrolak, Board of Education. Appreciate the opportunity to update you guys on um, the, this month's workings of the Buildings and Grounds Group. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the um, uh, Buildings and Grounds Associates for all the hard work they do. Um, this month, they've covered a lot of activities such as, you know, homecoming, the butterfly run, a um, bunch of football games, and all of which are outside of their normal schedules. And it's never difficult finding um, folks to work these events. They love doing it. They love this school. And I think, um, you know, I owe it to them to constantly publicize that. They have really Absolutely. a lot of pride in what they do. Um, our district water continues to trend favorably. Our daily readings fall well within the EPA's permissible limits for safe uh, drinking water. So um, it's, it's pretty safe to say that the district water is safe to drink. Um, any questions regarding, regarding that? Um, an update on the Chester Academy patio. The final update, that patio has been completed, phase one. So um, it took a little longer than we had anticipated. I did not anticipate the rain in the last couple months, so um, pretty diligently to have that area cleaned up and presentable for homecoming. Um, and I think it's a very functional, appropriate area for a school setting, and it seems to be getting um, pretty good use, I think. Um, and finally, an update on the Maple Ave sinkhole. Uh, so that has been. <laughs> Uh, repaired and covered fully. The uh, DPW poured a new sidewalk today. There's a couple uh, um, asphalt patches that need to be taken care of, but other than that, that project is pretty much. I uh, submitted my, my board report to you guys. There's a lot more information on there, so if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask. I had none. Were there any questions, concerns for Mr. DeRosa? 
you're talking specifically about the water. Uh, your report was very thorough, so. Yeah, very good report. You have a lot going on. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot going on. Uh, yes. You have a lot going on. Are you more updates on those? Yeah, the board is anxious, you know, with the water, all the water options that we have. So that's, um, like Mrs. Nagler said, there's there's a lot going on there. So. So I think I have an opportunity to meet with you guys in executive session in two weeks. Yes. That's mm -hmm. correct. So yep. Look forward to that. Okay. Very good. Any questions, concerns, comments? Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Rachel Loftus, how are you? Well, how are you? Joyous. Good evening, Mr. Petschak, Mr. Sambets, members of the Board of Education, Chester Community. Um, a few updates from the Special Education Office. Um, annually, Chester hosts an Access VR Information Night. Um, Access VR provides vocational rehabilitation through the New York State Department of Education. They provide many services that assist students with obtaining and maintaining career path and job opportunities. Um, that night was originally scheduled for last night, Tuesday, October 26th, and um, we had to reschedule it due to technicalities. So. Um, Every junior and senior family should have received an email update from my office. And they will be receiving an invitation in the mail for the new date, which is now December 14th. It will be held at 7 p.m. here at Chester Academy, and it will be in person. So look for that. It should be coming in the mail this week. Um, Social-emotional learning updates. Um, students district-wide from pre-K to 12 had an opportunity to participate in a social emotional wellness survey that was created um, based on some surveys through uh, different sources and as well as questions created by our counselors. Every question on every uh, survey has been dissected by our counseling teams in each building um, and we're working on developing action plans based on any areas of need. So that is uh, where we're at with each of those. In each building, we have a team working on that. For our staff members, we are also developing a social emotional wellness survey, and that will be distributed on our upcoming superintendent's conference day on November 2nd. Um, some members that are working on the survey are all three of our school psychologists, Monica Azero, Emma McKay, Rebecca Davis, as well as Dianara Garcia and myself. Um, so that is in the works and will be distributed on November 2nd. Uh, just an update regarding some uncertainty with one of our special education preschools, Field of Dreams. Um, there was uh, some uh, uncertainty whether they would be able to remain open. However, late last week, they announced that they will be remaining open. So that's great news for the three Chester preschool students that currently attend there, as well as many students around the county. So we're very glad to hear that. Uh, that concludes my report for tonight. Are there any questions? My questions was gonna be on Field of Dreams, but you covered it in your report. So we appreciate that. Were there any questions, comments for Ms. Loftus? Mm -hmm. Ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you as always. I believe Mr. Spence. Mm. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, how are we doing? Good, how are you? All right, so it's very good to see everybody this evening. Um, thank you again for all you do as members of the Board of Education. Board of Education members are not paid once again. It's a, uh, a very long hour job. It's sometimes a thankless job. Thank you for all that you do. And of course, have a happy Halloween. Hopefully we get some um, nice weather on Sunday for the trick and treaters. So I have submitted my board report to you and um, I won't read uh, you know, everything in the board report. A couple things I wanna to touch upon though and go to your questions. So in my report, it talked about the digital equity survey and how we had started that in September. It's a survey that's required of all uh, school districts in New York State um, this year. 
The final data is actually not due until June, but New York State does want to see some initial data findings as of December. So we got ahead of this and we jumped on this and we started um, polling our parents with a Google form. We thanked parents, approximately 177 parents filled out the form in September and we're very happy to do that. We thank Mr. Agar helped us to make a Spanish version of the form and we got some uh, replies in September. Subsequently, School Tools came out with their own survey tool uh, when we found out that it had to be tied to the student ID and uploaded to the data warehouse. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the data that was in the form. We're not going to make parents do double work. Anybody who's not submitted the form, we will have the School Tools form active very soon. And anybody who's not had a chance to submit the form can submit through the parent portal. And then that way we can make it all work in a data upload um, to report to the state for December and June. So there are 10 standard questions and they're saying they want 100% uh, completion this year. Last year, if you recall, we did a survey and we got about 98% with many phone calls and emails to parents. So that is the digital survey. Um, you know, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my report. The other thing I really wanted to talk about briefly tonight is um, to thank the tech team for all the efforts that they made uh, this summer in uh, summer projects, summer hardware projects. So I just briefly wanted to show you a couple things that we worked on this summer, um, which was linked in my board report. Mm -hmm. So as you see, possibly behind you, very brief PowerPoint, six slides, no more. These are the summer technology project updates for summer 2021. And briefly, to give you an overview, uh, at the CES Makerspace, we were able to add, thanks to the voters, thanks to the board and the budget, we were able to add 60 new laptop computers for the Makerspace to work with the LEGO software. Uh, that is software that will not work with a Chromebook, so we needed laptop computers. So we were able to do that, uh, again, thanks to the effort of our tech team. Mr. Patel and others. Okay. We're good? Okay. All right. Okay, moving on. Uh, we were able to replace 18 smart boards this uh, summer with new line boards. And so we did that around the uh, district, seven in each building for equity, and we're happy to do that. We have a few smart boards left, and we'd like to uh, update those in our next year budget, and then we'll be done with smart boards next summer. At the Academy, we worked on room 113, which is uh, the technology room on the first floor, and we did upgrades to that room, as you see in the picture. Uh, there are dual monitors in the room, and that was all a special configuration with a special type of video card, so that works for Mr. Heyer and others who use that room. Um, at the Academy Makerspace, which you're going to hear about from Ms. O'Hara in a minute and others, um, we helped with the installation of the new computers, the dual monitors, the configurations to the th 3D printers to make sure everything works to meet the needs of the Makerspace plan. And then finally, um, as far as software, we required a new software, as we talked about, called ClassLink. ClassLink is a time saver. It helps students um, and parents by being able to get on the Chromebooks a lot quicker. It is single sign-on, which means once you sign into ClassLink, you should be able to be able to be signed in automatically to a number of products like Reading A to C and BrainPop and so forth. So um, the teachers are very happy about this for the K through two students. We also printed out QR codes and QR codes for any other classes that wanted them at the elementary school so that the child could just simply hold up a QR quick card and it will get them onto the class link interface and they don't have to put in any passwords, they don't have to log into any portals and so forth. So very briefly, um, we met with one of the teachers, Ms. Maggi, and she was nice enough to give us a couple minutes to show us how this is working for them at the elementary school. Okay, the sound, there seems to be an issue with the sound, Mr. Patel. Let's try again. I had to log into ClassLink with her QR card and scan for us. Okay, hold it a little closer. There you go. Thank you. Now it begins loading all the students' data and logging them into their websites.
After a brief moment, it loads all the students' apps, including BrainPup, Lililo, and Zern, and it's made things much easier for them. We are so excited to have Class Link brought to Chester. It's going to make our lives so much easier, especially in the primary grades. So logging in is super easy. They can find their programs really easy, and we can get up and running really fast now. So that was a special thanks to um, Ms. Maggie for giving that feedback and for our student who um, showed that demonstration. So that shows you a little bit about ClassLink. There are one or two programs with ClassLinks, which we are still in the process of configuring. HMH Science, we're in the last throes of that. And then we're moving on to the Destiny Library software. But we're very happy that things are going well. Um, you know, we were warned in advance this is a four to five month project, and we seem to be on track with that as per what other districts have been doing. So thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions on my report or anything in the area of technology? No, my comment was going to be before you uh, highlighted out your summer projects. <clears throat> board just wanted to thank you and staff to if people don't realize the work that gets done as it is, like we talked about with Matt and his team over the summer. This, all this behind the scenes is a ton of work that you guys accomplished this summer. And we all appreciate all the hard work that went into it. So it's really, it's, I don't know how it all gets done. It really is a kudos to all of you for making it all happen. We appreciate it again. Thanks to Mr. Patel and the tech team. You know, there's a lot of balls in the air and we try to coordinate things so that in September we're ready to open. Summer has become the busiest time of the year. Yep. So we appreciate it. Really it. And thank you for your school board service. Oh, thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, Ms. O'Hara, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? So joyous. Good evening, everyone. I am very excited to be able to present with the team here from the elementary school and from the academy, our STEM program. And I promised the team that I would keep it under two hours because you know how I've been going on and on about STEM. <laughs> we have all night. <laughs> so uh, we joining, have food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, joining me this evening. Excuse me, Ms. O'Hara, use, please use the microphone so we'll pick it up. It's so hard to stay still for me. Okay. And I'll take off my mask. So joining me this evening, is that better? Yes. All right. Usually I'm very loud, so I don't need it. Uh, we have Ms. Rendy from Chester Elementary School. She is our lead STEM teacher and coordinator. We also have Mr. Rodman. He is the lead teacher and coordinator of the STEM program at the middle school and high school. And also, we do have Mrs. Downick here, who does a phenomenal job in ensuring the A, that STEM turns into STEAM, integrating arts and music into the program. So I'm going to start with the program foundation, and the team will join in to provide a K-12 overview. Uh, so the program, and I don't think the mic is working, so I will use my volume, um, initiated, uh, or one component of the, the program was uh, bringing a STEM advisory council together, and that was um, comprised of teachers, uh, parents, school, the school board members, superintendent, administration, local businesses and manufacturing, as well as um, the STEM departments of local colleges in the area. And the purpose of that was to ensure that as we began and progressed the STEM initiative that we had the input from various stakeholders. Um, so we began with a vision statement in 2017. We identified program components and then worked towards goals. The vision statement, and usually I don't read slides, but this one is impactful and important to read. So the Chester School District develops global leaders by providing students with learning opportunities that foster critical thinking, 
creativity, collaboration, and communication. Students engage in authentic applications that support inquiry and innovation through partnerships with their community, local businesses, and higher education. And I'll say for the Chester School District, that extends beyond just science, technology, engineering, and math. It is throughout all of the disciplines, and that is our goal in how students experience education in our district. So what, what do graduates of the Chester School District look like? What are they mastering? They are masters of academic content, articulate and confident communicators. That starts as early as kindergarten, by the way. Strategic users of technology. Mr. Spence just shared as all of the applications that we're progressing in terms of technology. Innovative, effective collaborators. And thanks to uh, some changes in terms of social distancing, we are bringing back the ability to safely work in groups and collaborate, ethical citizens, and self-directed learners. In thinking about these goals, what was clearly important in progressing this program, thanks to the support of the District and Board of Education at the time, was professional development. And I can speak uh, myself, I was sent to the Boston Museum of Science to train with lead educators across the country on the program Engineering is Elementary which then we turnkeyed and uh, worked with the staff at the elementary school to train on that program. Uh, the district brought in Buck Institute, which is a nationally recognized um, professional development leader in project-based learning. Uh, and so with any initiative, it's, it's key that the teachers inv are involved and supported in professional development. And, and truly the success of the program has been the educators that we have in this district. So K-12 overview. So throughout, and, and now we'll be bringing it, thankfully, we have pre-K, so they will be a part of this program as well. But it's three themes um, that are prevalent throughout the program. We have the engineering design process, programming and robotics, and project-based project learning and business partnerships, all within those skill sets of critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication. You'll see that actually on the wall of our makerspace, thanks to Ms. Rendy. So kindergarten through fifth grade, what does it look like? We're still looking at these skills beginning in now pre-K at the elementary school and progressing through fifth grade. I'm gonna have Ms. Rendy talk about the engineering design process at the elementary school and what it currently looks like. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you? But this is a different picture of this one. So what does the engineering design process look like in the elementary school? It seems like a big, huge task to take. And if you look at this, the graphics we have here, this is where we began in the first graphic. And the next one is where we are now. If you come into the makerspace in the elementary school, you'll see the engineering design process takes over an entire lar large wall. So all of those students, K through five, are seeing that on a daily basis, and they're very familiar with it. When they leave fifth grade, they are very familiar with all of those steps, even in kindergarten and now preschool. And on, in the kindergarten, kindergarten, K through two primary level, what we really focus on are building challenges. And they're the most basic stage, and it serves to build a foundation of skills of problem solving, teamwork, communication, and grit. Um, our students are introduced to problems as situations that people want to change. They become familiar with the engineering design process and follow the basic steps on a very elemental level. Students learn how to work in a group, finally that we're back to working together safely, discover communication solutions, how to talk to each other, share ideas, and listen to each other, and effectively, effectively use the materials and persevere despite difficulties and failures, which is the biggest thing for primary. <laughs> they expect it to be perfect the first time, and that's something that we really overcome. And we, we spend a lot of time on that. And we look at mistakes or failures as just ways that we can make our devices or whatever the challenge is even better. So we really work on that a lot. And this works in nicely because it builds confidence and critical thinking skills so that every new challenge also fits in nicely with our SEL initiative as well. So if you see, here we have some of our K-1-2 students. And here what they were working on a problem that we read the story of Fox and the Grapes. 
And we identified the problem in that story as the fox wants these grapes, but he can't reach them. So their challenge was to design a device to help fox solve his problem, to help him reach those grapes. So when we're looking at the engineering design process, all those steps that we took, the very basic levels would be planning, coming up with ideas and talking to each other. And you can see how they're planning here, very basic sketches of what their designs would be, how they would use their materials, and then they're given those materials to now create. Create, test, improve, and then share with the group. So they do have the basic foundations of the engineering process as early as K-1-2. So what does the engineering design process look like in three through five? Well, this is where we really start focusing on each component of the engineering design process. And students in grades three to five focus on engineering design challenges and apply math and science concepts to problems using the engineering design process. Students are systematically guided through each step of identifying the problem, researching, brainstorming, designing, building, testing, and improving, and sharing their solutions. The problem is defined with criteria and constraints. They leave fifth grade knowing that vocabulary and hopefully go to Ben and Jeff ready to go with those. The problem is defined as using criteria for success and constraints as possible of possible solutions. Students research and consider a multitude of possible solutions and after testing and improving learn to optimize the solutions to create the best possible design. This process enhances stu students' critical thinking skills while integrating math and science skills into an engaging, hands-on engineering project. If you look at this project in particular, fourth grade learns about simple machines as well as energy. And this project in particular was to design a catapult based on the simple machine of a lever and kinetic and potential energy. And you can see that they have their design process there. We actually had a competition down the hall to see which one could launch it the furthest, which one was most consistent. We then follow scientific method process of trials and variables as well. So, and they have a lot of fun with this. Chucking pumpkins, which actually is a real, a real event. 21 years pumpkin chunking challenge in Delaware. We watched a short video on that. When I told them, okay, this is what we're going to be doing, their eyes popped out of their heads and said, oh, real pumpkins across the field? No, candy pumpkins, but it's just as fun. So it was all those things together. And so what does that look like even through a pandemic? So even for the last two years, we have been able to continue with this. So if you look at, we have some, the top two pictures were from this year, working together, still masks, still safely distanced. We can see some pictures down below where student, we were still having a STEM class when we were fully remote. Right there you can see little Allison, she made a bird feeder. And then even last year when we were in and we had to work individually, we weren't able to work with partners or groups, but we still were able to follow the engineering design process, have certain challenges. We went outside um, creating paper rockets while measuring and following the scientific method. We made um, solar ovens as well. Um, and we were talking a lot about in third and fourth grade about solar energy, wind power. So we made windmills as well, see how, which one could lift the most and do the most work. So. We were still able to do it despite all of our obstacles. And here we have Ms. Dunnick, you can add to this please, and Mr. Sparkman. Hello. How are you? Um, so Mr. Sparkman and I already presented uh, the majority of this to you, which mm -hmm. I'm excited because we will be presenting it at uh, the NYSADA conference nice. at the end of November as well. Um, but through the grant, through the Orange Rockland um, utilities, we are able to get bare conductive touch boards, uh, which use its circuit technology to create uh, interactive, we use it to create an interactive art exhibit. So the students studied their birds, built birds in art class, recorded the bird sounds in music class, and then we put it all together with STEAM using the um, technology the students were able to create an interactive exhibit that all of the students were able to come to and visit um, and then if you touch certain points on the board that were labeled with little yellow stickers it would either make the sound of the bird or it would read um, the recording of the students informational text that we tackled in art class which was fun um, 
but we had their informational text as well as their bird sounds. Um, so they were really able to tackle all of it of STEAM, incorporating art, music with their science and technology. Your, your presentation was a highlight. The board still talks, it was a great job. Thank you, I'm excited at the presentation in November. We're actually gonna let all of our participants attempt to make birds and make bird sounds. Oh, excellent. So I think it'll be really fun. <laughs> I think our students will probably top the adults, just saying. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Downick also uh, does claymation with her students, um, which is phenomenal. She also is responsible. Back on the mic. She also is responsible. So claymation she does with her students, and she also is responsible for numerous projects through Donors Choose, for example, I had shared previously that uh, she was able to bring in the first 3D printer to the elementary school thanks to her efforts on Donors Choose. So um, really it's just an amazing team and we're happy that the makerspace through uh, Mrs. Bosch's support and uh, Ms. Rendy and the staff at the elementary school, the makerspace is officially back in action. Um, I will speak on our programming and robotics. Uh, this has been on hold for two years uh, in order to honor the safety measures because this is very much a collaborative program. Um, kindergarten and first grade are introduced to robotics through stationary robots, dash and dot. So kindergartners learn basic program. They learn about what it means to be an engineer. Uh, they learn that engineers solve problems and make our lives easier, and they talk about things that they would do if they were an engineer. Um, a robot that makes the bed was very popular at the time. <laughs> um, but they do learn basic programming, so with DOT, the stationary robot, they're learning how just through touch to code um, sound, color, lights. Uh, they're doing counting within their coding and programming. And then DOT in first grade, or excuse me, DASH in first grade is a movable robot. So now they're progressing from a stationary to a movable. They're learning about uh, distance, um, how many units forward, how many units back. Uh, we've even had, actually, Mrs. Downick um, created a huge town in which the students, and it was Chester, the students would program the robot to uh, move through different points in town. You can program the robot to hit a particular sight word, and there's all kinds of learning uh, links to the next-gen standards in terms of beyond programming and robotics. Uh, in second grade and third grade, we morph from a built, pre-built robot to one that students have to build. So they, the students are working from um, a 2D image to build a 3D model, and we talk about the importance of precision. We talk about um, components such as gears and levers and how that impacts the functionality. And what's really uh, impressive is the bringing back the idea that engineers improve designs. So we question Lego's design. For example, the drumming monkey. Why did Lego pick a monkey? Why is a monkey drumming? Probably from the toy that we grew up with. But they actually change and improve the design um, down to the beats that the monkey is able to do, which ties in with music and cams that are in a car and in an engine. Um, the Ferris wheel, we talk about, Fer they, they learn about Ferris wheels around the world. And um, they look at the design, for example, I think I showed in previous presentations, Lego's Ferris wheel holds one person and there's no seatbelt. So <laughs> the students were all over that, putting in seatbelts for safety and uh, bringing in how could they attract customers to their Ferris wheel. So designing signs and, and the list goes on. Like I said, um, I have to be cut off when I talk about STEM. <laughs> so fourth and fifth grade, we then move into a very high level of robotics, which is EV3. Uh, EV3 has been used in high schools and colleges. Um, that is a very high-end, very complex type of programming where students are doing everything from, if you have to have your robot, once it's built, turn, you're doing it at what angle? So very much bringing in mathematics, uh, precisions with how many rotations of a wheel equals a certain distance, uh, how does speed impact uh, distance, and uh, the list goes on. So it's really, the, the program itself is very impressive, and I, I know Ms. Rendy is looking forward to, to bringing it back this year, and uh, we'll be working together to do that. So again, it, here's just a quick picture of Dash and Dot. The students are working collaboratively together, and that's that touch point screen. Um, quick picture of Lego We Do. Again, that's a close-up, and you can see the importance of those two gears lining up 
If they don't line up exactly, then the, it's not going to function. We also talk about when they're building it, and you can see the, the case of components there, of Lego pieces. You know, oftentimes, if things aren't put back accurately and you're missing a piece in the next build, that's gonna slow down your project. And we talk about a real job site and, and what happens on a real job site when the, the uh, items for the build aren't there on time. Well, those that work on an actual job site know that that costs a lot of money. So we, we talk about the real implications of that. For them, it's frustrating, it slows down their process. In the real world, it actually costs a lot of money. Um, and there's our Lego EV3. In all in all, in, in every application, they have a very professional setup with folders, engineering team numbers, um, they have nameplates, and when they step into the room uh, working as robotic engineers, they are professionals. And so there's no, there's no tolerance, and we don't, we don't complain anyway in the elementary school, but um, it is you are professionals and you have to work through a problem. You know, the teachers are not there to solve it for you, you're going to have to work through it. And uh, we're really proud. Um, I'm extremely proud of the program and very thankful again to the support of the, of the school board uh, because we are unique in the fact that we established our program at the elementary level. Most districts do not start at the elementary level. They start at middle school or high school. But uh, the program was represented at both the Lake Placid, uh, New York State School Board Convention, as well as New York City. And I'm um, very proud that the elementary school is highlighted as a unique uh, school in the district, in the county and beyond that, that has such a focus on robotics. Uh, this is phase two of our makerspace, which is across from the current makerspace. And uh, right now we already have new flooring in. Thank you to Matt DeRosa's team. Uh, this space is going to be targeted to programming and robotics um, and also green screen technology. So uh, we envision that there will be perhaps a news show. Uh, students can uh, read a writing piece while having a real world uh, design or theme or uh, m moving picture behind them. So this is really exciting and it's, and it's starting uh, to completion. Project-based learning is the third tier. Again, that flows across pre-K, I'll say, to 12th, excuse me, to 12th grade. Um, we're bringing in pre-K applications this year. So previously, we've worked with everyone from handspring technology, using prosthetic design with our sixth grade students, tectonic engineering, Solar City, President Container, which is a manufacturer in Middletown, New York. They've been instrumental in supporting our program, and the list goes on. And I'm not going to, I'm just going to give one example. I cut out about 40 slides. So uh, one example, our fourth graders um, a few years ago worked with uh, Chris Burke. He's the geotechnical engineer of tectonic engineering. And he talked with students about geotechnical engineering because that was one of their units that they were uh, working on with engineering as elementary. So they were learning about being a geotechnical engineer, evaluating landscapes, and uh, Mr. Burke from Tectonic was uh, sharing with the students core samples from New York City and talking to them about how he decides or, or how buildings uh, can only be built on certain uh, grounds. Um, Ms. Rennie is going to step up and talk about some of the current things that are happening with project-based learning and business partnerships. You're welcome. Here we have, we worked with, and this is just this year, a couple weeks ago actually, we had Mad Science come in and work with, we have fifth graders here, first graders, and kindergarten. So that's one, one aspect that we've worked with. But we've worked with um, Kelder Farms, in particular second graders, when I was second grade teacher there, we worked with them as far as integrating um, pest management and how to go about doing that. Uh, pollinators, we, I feel like we're very lucky as a district to have Steve Newhouse as a constituent here, and I have two of his children, he is a beekeeper. We had him come in with some other beekeepers um, to present to our classes as well. So that was a big one. Legoland, the fact that we have Legoland here. Right before we left for COVID, we were, I was working very closely with a master builder there and he had planned on coming in and talking to the class about his career as being a Lego builder and how they go about um, making the huge you know, structures that they make. 
Um, and we do have, actually have a parent who now took over that spot, who I also spoke to, who will be coming in as well, to talk about that. So we're very lucky where we are and who we have involved. Um, so those are just some things that are coming up. We recently had a topographer come in third grade right now is working on landforms and um, geography and so we are in the process of making a huge world map with all the continents so we had a topographer come in and talk about how he goes about and how maps are made and he actually has a laser printer that he makes topographical wooden maps out of and so he was able to show the students how he uses Google Maps in order to do that so we have a lot of things coming in a lot of working with our community all those things and more. And now, to see what goes on in 6 through 12, we have Mr. Rodman. Thank you. You're very welcome. Good evening. Thank Good you evening. for giving me the time to present. Uh, it's actually a really great privilege to talk about the STEM here at the high school. So, like the elementary school, you're going to see the same three themes throughout all the middle school and high school. Mr. Harrison is many of the design process, starting at the sixth grade, which is awesome because previously you just heard the seven from the text mm -hmm. So we going to have to about that. Um, so talk about six to seven. Uh, six, 12, it's very, it's an exciting time because we have two tech teachers, which means we can offer twice the opportunities for our students. Um, which is just, it's priceless for me. And Mr. Hayer is just enjoying every moment of it um, as a new teacher. And it's great to have somebody to collaborate with and discuss with. From that, we are able to, the engineering design process, we pick up where you guys left off in fifth grade. This, our sixth grade team has the STEM, and you're going to see about that STEM class, et cetera, seven, eight. But the cool thing about our sixth grade STEM is Mr. Hayden gets to push in and start with that foundation of materials processing sense of the basics of tools and simple machines and how to go off. You're going to see that programming will start in seventh. Uh, programming robotics will start in seventh, and that actually now carries through all the way to senior year. The one thing that is constant is everything is problem based learning. My approach and Mr. Hayes' approach is the same is present the students with an authentic problem, have them use the engineer design process to solve it. Graduates, just as the elementary presented, you know, we want them to be in an engineering sense and a technical sense. The content needs to be rigorous. Uh, it can't just be basic, kind of what I was brought up with, with woodworking. It has to be modernized. It has to include programming. It has to include modern equipment. And skills that they're going to actually be able to go get jobs with. Skills that they're going to actually be able to show with a portfolio. This is what I can do when they go to a trade school or to the college, or whatever the next step after Chester Academy is. They need to be confident. They need to be able to communicate. Both Mr. and Mr. Hayer both agree at the end of the design process, there's that feedback piece. There's that, I presented this, this is what went well, this is what didn't go well. It, uh, I think it's always great when we do it is not to be like, this is where I failed, but when a student does something, like we used a vinyl cutter today, a student cut it out, he got all the pieces off the vinyl. To do the sign, he realized he took all the opposite pieces off. And I'm like, how fascinating. And he's like, but I messed up. But I'm like, but we're not going to do it again, but how fascinating is this? And how can we flip that? So kind of bringing that idea of, yeah, in engineering, in technology, we're going we're gonna to make mistakes. There's going to be things that we're going to do and it's going to fail, but how fascinating is that and how, you know, how can we use that to kind of promote, like, let's try this out. With all the new equipment, it's been awesome in the sense of the kids this week are uh, mechatronic students. Has had, uh, the last seven weeks, they've built up, six weeks, they built up their skills on the vinyl cutter. They built up their skills on the laser engraver and cutting and understanding how the softwares that we presented them with is, and how to use that software to communicate their design and how to upload that design or their solution into the machine to actually manufacture it. This week it was really cool to just to give them the week and say you need to come up with one solution to this problem. Use any resource you have. Prior to this, it would have been more of Come up with a solution, but use you know traditional woodworking equipment, the bandsaw, the table saw, whatever, uh, the sander, to be actually able to use the software, program it, and see it through that way. Still using a manufacturing process, but in a modern age. Technology, uh, there has been no doubt the IT team, uh, Mr. Spence has been supporting us. We have overseen. <laughs> 
countless things that we didn't predict that was going to happen. Uh, and they've been real supportive to get us the technology to do that so the students can use it so it's seamless. The rest of it, self-directed learners, at, although the last six weeks have been with, uh, as we go through this, you know, kind of getting them back up to skills, but pretty, uh, I would believe that in, as we progress and get off this COVID, kind of getting everybody caught up, that it's going to go much smoother with the sense of here's your problem, kind of like what we did with engineering this week, and run with it. So as we look at this, I'm going to kind of give how we got here and where we're going. So we started out, we revamped the whole program. So we started out, we said, what do we need to, what do the students need to learn? And we looked at our standards, the MST standards from New York. And they're written in the ni early, late 90s, early 2000s. So they're a little dated. They still talk about leather working, which is not really modern. It's more of a craft now. So we expanded that. We looked at the international education and engineering standards. We went to the standards of what careers. We worked with Ms. Besson to talk about the career development and occupations. We also looked at the next generation standards, the new standards about environmental science and sustainability, and then the brand new standards that New York State just released about computer science and digital fluency. We took these, went grade level by grade level, created the benchmarks of what we want the STEM to be from 6 to 12. We looked at what we had in the sense of the major part was infrastructure. Where are we right now with the first floor technology suite, the digital fabrication library upstairs, and what could we do? Uh, ideas of running like, oh, we, transportation, there was a lot, we did a survey with the students. Kids are like, oh, we really like cars. Having a car lab here would never work. So we looked at um, things like that. We looked at it and we're like, okay, the end of the day, what was the authentic experience that we could give the kids? We also looked at the equipment. Uh, there was a lot of aging equipment in the tech room for when it was bought was modern technology, but now is not essential. And we were able to secure new technology and we looked at you know, time and kind of what is the passion of our teachers and what is the passion of our students. When we looked at developing courses, we looked at you know, the new courses, we looked at our neighboring districts. We, out of the Orange County districts, we were able to find 13 course syllabuses with, I'm sorry, course, catalogs, and we looked at each of the courses they offer. We also looked at the course descriptions. Design and Draw, everybody offers. It's a basic ninth grade introduction to technology course, and it also counts for an art credit. So it's a kind of a double, to me, I call it a double dip course where you get your technology experience, but you also get your art. What was interesting to see was the push for computer science, uh, the push for principles of engineering and robotics. And when you start to look at what other districts are doing around us, you start to see the same trends at the elementary school and the themes, uh, the same trends and themes that we're doing in the elementary school. CAD, architecture, energy and power, and digital electronics made up, these are the top eight courses. We looked at what our community could offer, what businesses and industries that we have, how could we use those for internships, mentorships, expertise, what was our local colleges, what colleges offered majors. We reached out to the colleges like SUNY Alfred, we said what skills do you need the students to have? Or what skills are you missing? What skills can we help with? The biggest was measurement. Students need to learn how to measure, not just in inches, but in using different tools. So we found uh, digital resource, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, digital multimeters. We found, you know, they provided us with a whole list. We figured out what connections we have with uh, OCC, and then we also looked at OUC, I'm sorry, OU BOCES programs. So we weren't, uh, <clears throat> offering something that they already offered, and it could be something unique to us. From this, we looked at our students. We sat down with guidance. We talked about the college, you know, what, was the, what does a college-bound student look like? What courses are they taking? What skills do they need? And what is their goals after the academy? We did this with the trade school students and the workforce students, and we looked at the past experiences to design that program. What this really brought us to is what is life after the academy for our students? <clears throat> How do we develop that coursework? Uh, that allows us to communicate that this is where our students have learned and this is where our students are going. How do we encourage that? We talked with colleges and it was interesting to see what they required, but it was also interesting to see what they're like, this is not what we require anymore. Or this is, you know, this is a new way to do this. The portfolios is a big key. The, the only way we really get to communicate with colleges, with the transcripts, was another big key in developing courses. So you notice with the courses, they are like half they are half year courses, so we have mechatronics, and then we have engineering, uh, civil engineering, where we can communicate that that student has done both of these concepts. 
And then the last was, how can the students use what they've learned in class with authentic experiences to talk about you know, technology and engineering in their, <clears throat> in their recommendations, but also in their uh, college essays, and what books and videos can we bring in to bring addition? So this is where we are, where we are at. We got two, two technology teachers, we got six new course sequences. These courses are half year and they go in sequence. So there's a whole program from six all the way to 12. The six original courses we've revamped to bring in new technologies. Uh, you're gonna see in the next few slides. The softwares, uh, Mr. Spence has been really good with the softwares and helping us implement those. We got 50 pieces of hardware. This includes the dual monitors, switches, and additional things that Nick Patel and the IT interns have really just helped set up and get set going. The other things we got is, as you guys saw, the laser cutters, the CNC machines, all the resources and equipment that really support the high-end tech, as well as we've been able to find the low-end tech or the more, the more like traditional tech, where we're able to get the drills, presses to help with the manufacturing part. We're able to secure robots, the VEX robotics, which is really the top line of robots for education. And then we have the two spaces. Uh, I call it the digital fabrication upstairs and then tech downstairs. We employ the engineering design process. We build upon what you guys, do, what the elementary does. We present the problem, the students create the solution. They always want to go with that first solution, which is, it's funny to see, it's whatever it's usually Google says on the first one. <laughs> and we make them, so you know, brainstorm, sketch, come up with list, whatever it does to get, you know, to get the creativity going. They can refine that, uh, which is funny because always in seventh grade it was, let's add glitter. And I'm like, I don't think that's refining. But <laughs> we, you know, we progress. And the great part about this is when we start with sixth grade, it's just gonna even help better. We model the solution, we test it, we talk about what went well, what didn't. We communicate it, and then we improve it, which throughout the whole thing, I'm always, the students are always looking for feedback, and I'm always looking for feedback from the students. So this is where we're at. We have the engineering in the middle school. STEM 6 with infused techs, infused tech. Uh, it's sixth grade, 40 weeks, it meets daily. Mr. Hayer walks, uh, joins the sixth grade STEM team. <clears throat> Design and technology is seventh grade. It's still, the uh, it's still the same process we used, I'm sorry, the same schedule we used last year. Same with eighth. The cool part about eighth is the kids can elect to go into a mechatronic, uh, intro to mech tech, which is more advanced technology and it, uh, more advanced, so it kind of leads them into the ninth grade program. When we get to the high school, it starts out with DDP, and then it starts to branch out in 11th grade to different fields. So they go into DDP, it's a one year, <clears throat> a one year course, and they learn about design and draw in the sense of AutoCAD, and then learn basically how to use the digital equipment, such as the CNC laser cutter, vinyl cutter, um, and that. From there we go into CAD, and computer-aided drawing. In these two courses, they're gonna create a portfolio for each. And each year, they can add to their portfolio. And the portfolio, each, as uh, I like to call CAD and computer-aided manufacturing, like DDP2, it's more advanced. So like, in DDP, we will do something basic as in like, hypothetically, like a coaster design for a drink. In CAD, we will go into, okay, how do you manufacture that in your team? And how do you manufacture that in your team? And how do you sell that? kind of the market. This will bring us into, they can pick three paths. Engineering graphics, which is offered through SUNY Oswego for college credit. Mechatronics and robotics is two half year courses. Civil engineering and architecture, which is also two half year courses. And then their senior year, they can do a capstone. So let's talk about sixth grade. Sixth grade has done awesome, the team has done awesome. Uh, in previous things, they've done the garden, they've done seed folk, and they've done the greenhouse. And they've been able to do all this without a tech room or a tech supplies or, or you know, a tech teacher there. So having him infused with that, it's going to be awesome to see with all those resources what they can really do. Seventh grade, we uh, started used to, <clears throat> we started with the foundations of what is a system, how does it work, you know, what is the basic manufacturing processes, what is the inputs of a system, the resources, and it was basically just technology. <clears throat> Mr. Hayers uh, is able to build off that approach because we have additional equipment coming. 
and we able to, he's actually started with Tinkercad with the new lab down there. Eighth grade is building off of that again. Mr. Hayer is using right now uh, VEX, I'm sorry, EV3 Robotics to teach uh, robot, obviously robots, that's not weird. But he's also incorporating the intro to mech tech where he will be up in the makerspace upstairs to show him laser cutting 3D printing. Ninth grade is where I started, DDP. Kids are, we started with CAD, we're gonna go into Inventor, which is more advanced, and then we're gonna end up in Revit for a quick build. These students will basically learn how to do mechanical drawing like I was taught back in the day, but, then it, but in the sense of a modern version. Students will walk out with a portfolio that uh, is basic in two-dimensional drawing, but is a skill that they'll be able to laser cut or basically any two-dimensional shape. Tenth grade, students can divide, uh, take computer-aided drawing or computer-aided manufacturing. It's building off the skills, as you can see David there, you know, 3D printing a Chrysler building. Uh, that was the first step. The next step would be actually designing your own building or your own 3D print to work together in pieces. Eleventh grade, it's, that's where the pathways are, mechatronics. Um, you see up there, there's mechatronics is, uh, you know, there's a CNC horse that they cut out. Uh, I believe it was Tristan Cole two years ago, but that's the kind of project where the project get a little bit bigger, a little bit more integrated, and a little, you know, the design process is going to take longer time. Silver engineering architecture, they come <coughs> up with an architecture portfolio that they can submit to a college. Now, some colleges are not even, they're saying, we want to make a portfolio. That portfolio will also transfer into that. And then engineering and graphics, that's a SUNY one, where we use Inventor and the higher end softwares to do digital things. This is the class they're going to use VR to design objects. And then 12th grade is your capstone. Uh, each student who goes through this process will have a capstone project that we oversee. Uh, it solves a real world problem. Students are also able to take Word of Tech or Energy and Power in 12th grade. These are science or math credit bearing courses that they can earn the credit for that. 12th graders are also able to take programming with Mr. Hayer. And then future planning. And thank you to Mr. Rodman and, and Ms. Rendy. And I mean, in, in terms of, you know, I could walk up here and, and I could talk about the program, but to see the program at its roots and to see where the program ends up is, is phenomenal. It's, it's incredible to see what our, what our teachers have done and, and it started in its roots. You know, before I got here, it was Mr. Petrolak and, and Ms. O'Hara and everybody along the way, Mr. Spence and the tech team. You know, we have to give a lot of credit to Mr. Brennan because we want to get a lot of this great equipment. He helps us figure out how we're going to get it and, and how we're going to be able to, to do that responsibly. And, and so we're, it, it's such a team effort to get us to this point. Um, so what's next for us here? You know, we are, we, we are looking ahead to, to taking everything we're doing now and creating this to be a regular part of what kids are doing at Chester Academy. So even not just in our classes, that this could be something that students do when they want to do something independent, when they want to go and, and, they, and they want to work on their own, they want to challenge themselves, and that's where the makerspace comes in, in terms of the idea and developing this makerspace, that you don't have to work on a 3D drawing just in, in, in a CAD class, that you can get to the makerspace and you can start creating your own ideas, and you can start doing that on your own time or after school, to really start to challenge and push yourself. And these are your, your, your real world problem solving, um, you know, things that are gonna help st uh, students as they, as they get out there. So we're looking for, we're, we're gonna be moving forward towards the makerspace, which a lot of the opportunities for that, that would be in that makerspace, we're already doing here, which is absolutely awesome. And we're doing that with fabrication at a higher level. We're also doing it at, with a very hands-on level, and that's what a makerspace is all about. It's not just the very high tech, it's the, it's, it's the hands-on tech as well. And so the space would be looking to, to integrate those things together. Um, so our next steps with that is we, we do have to thank Mr. DeRosa, who's had architects in here who are coming up with specific designs now at this point to make the makerspace architecturally work with what is the code in, in New York State. And that would be that'll be brought to your attention as soon as we have those plans for for the uh, for the makerspace, and 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 we can present that to you at a future meeting. And it, it's great to see that you know we are continuing to collaborate. That our internship program with Miss Barreto takes these opportunities 
that students are learning in the classroom and then helps them translate it out into the real world. Right now we have, you know, we have approximately 30 students that are out there in the real world working with different companies throughout you know, the, uh, the Chester Industrial Park to, you know, to the, the local police sheriff's department all over Orange County. So it's really been a, an incredible effort and, uh, and, that, and that's really a kind of a, a tribute to everybody here. Um, this is just, and, and you've seen this before, this is, a, this is just a, a, a make, a, a, I should say a markup of what the, the floor design is, but really what's gonna make the maker space uh, and, and the, a lot of little things can change on this is when we have students in there and when we have different specific challenges in there, different types of technologies and we have those machines and how we lay them out and different uh, you know, hands-on projects that will be in different areas of the room for kids to be able to pull out a bin and say, you know what, I'm gonna work on this little mini individual robotics challenge here you know, over in, in the hands-on area. Mr. Flanagan, uh, does somebody have a laser pointer? Did I see a laser pointer? Is this one here? Uh, yes. Oh. Can you just point out what we're looking at? I'm not sure if it's clear. Sure. Uh, the space that we're looking at. Sure. Kathy, where's my where's my laser button here? I don't want to. I don't want to zap anyone. Oh, Ow. Oh, no, I just. <laughs> didn't, uh, oh. All right, here we go. Is, oh, here we go. All right. You can tell. I'm not the one that points There's lasers at people. <laughs> uh, so. If we're looking here, this is this is our fabrication lab. So right this here. is the present library. So this is the pre oh yes, this is the present library. And if you were looking right here, this is where that big circulation desk is, that big giant desk. Um, this is right here. We have a lot of we have our stacks, and we have more stacks that are running up and down this way that take up most of the room. There is a computer lab over here that kind of goes back and forth. And then all the way over here, we have kind of a little, a little breakout area, a little back office here. And there's a closet, and the old ISS room would be right about here. So what we would be looking to do in this particular room is create an area where, if you see this counter here, there would be another counter along here that would have those, those, that machinery, such as the, it would call it, it's called the tech bar, where we would have those 3D printers and have those laser engravers. And when we talk about an architect, there are certain things that come along with that. How do we ventilate these machines? How do we make it so that they're running efficiently with our school facilities? Um, so that we don't trip the fire alarm. You know, all of these different things have to come into to how you create this area. This, these areas would be where students would research and design and lay out their, their, their formats before sending it to this machine. We've had a, a new teaching assistant that started this year. Specifically, she's been working with Mr. Rodman throughout the course of the day in his classes, almost like a student, to learn how to use these different programs that students are working. So when students want to come and work independently but run into an issue, we have somebody specifically in this area that can help them. And so we, we've really taken a big investment here. We've talked about having an area for students to present, um, an area for classes to come in, because classes might want to meet and need to have instruction before kids start breaking out throughout this room. Currently, this design has a couple of small breakout rooms in it. And what you're not seeing here is, you know, we, we're not just, just all of a sudden getting rid of the library, and this is the CAD design here. So this is where your computer area is. The library then would encompass the next two rooms over, which is the area that had the, you know, the old office and the old ISS room and into the next classroom moving down. So the square footage is very similar and would house our collection. And it would be part of one flowing space. You would flow from the library area over into the fabrication area, over into an area where people are getting their hands a little bit dirtier, you know, while, while, while working on things. So this is the vision and, and the people that helped get us here to this point, you know, are sitting here. You know, they're sitting in this room, they're working with kids on a daily basis, helping them understand this technology, this equipment, and making all those things that like Mr. Harris started at the beginning of the presentation of what a Chester Academy graduate's gonna look like and what our mission statement at the end of the day, this is, this is where we want to get them. Any questions? I think there's probably a thousand questions. <laughs> but I would first start off by saying to Ms. O'Hara that you would never have to apologize for going on and on, because to us you're not going on and on. When uh, people are talking about their passions I think that's what the public is seeing tonight. Um, I remember back in 2017 at our very first meeting, 
um, and the building blocks for where we are now. So uh, it's a long time coming, but it's a lot of planning, it's a lot of work, and throw in a pandemic, we're still ahead of the game. And I want the public to realize that this is the Chester School District. You know, when I laugh, when I think about, uh, we went to a conference in New York City about seven years ago and looked at maker spaces from all around New York State. You know, we're there. This, you know, and when we jumped off at that point, there was no looking back. And that's about, uh, that really is about having passion for, and a vision, and an engineering genius uh, in the building to get us there. So of uh, all the hard work of everybody, um, when people ask us why we serve on the school board, this is one of those reasons. So thank you to everybody. And one thing, I, I, if I could just say one more thing, the, the, the piece that's really brought this all together this year in terms of that gets Jen Rendy to, 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 to Jeff Rodman and helping you know, bring the, you know, Mary Kate and I on the same page is Kathy with, with the curriculum piece. It has been phenomenal this year and, and I can't thank her enough for helping us kind of get here, so. Excellent. Are there any other comments? I would just say that it is phenomenal to see the work that has gone in to the physical space. But beyond that, tying in all the different segments of the curriculum. So every piece fits together, whether you're in kindergarten, third grade, or 12th grade, there are components that are being woven together on a continuum that allow the students to experience all these things in, in a real life situation. Um, it's not just out of a textbook, it's application. And it's so important to see that so much thought and care goes into, not just by the administration, but by the staff, to make sure that we are providing something that works for every student. Not every student learns the same, we all know that. Not every student is going to perform the same, we all know that. So we need to find ways to make every child have their needs addressed and find a particular component that speaks to them that they'll be able to carry on once they leave the walls of this district. So it is, without a doubt, commendable, the amount of thought and work that has gone into developing the continuing program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, I have to say, given it is School Board Recognition Week, um, the school board supported staff and teachers going out of the district, going to Albany, um, going to East Syracuse, Manoa, and seeing what other districts are doing and not just trying to figure this out within the confines of the building. And that's very progressive and not a lot of schools do that and that was very impactful to the program. And again, I'll reinforce what Mr. Flanagan said in support of um, Mr. Flanagan leading the building and Mrs. Bosch, uh, Ms. Rendy, Mr. Rodman, Mr. Ayer, the tech team. Our teachers are, it really comes down to the teachers and the educators of the district because I talked about engineering as elementary and quite frankly, our teachers looked at that, we lived it for a while, then the teachers said we could do this better and they made it their own and they did do it better as did the sixth grade team, the seventh, the eighth grade and on. So we always have an education, these programs, right? But, but those programs are cookie cutter and what our Chester teachers do is they take programs and they make it better for what's going to be applicable to our students. So I thank you again for your support and I thank the teachers and the teacher leaders of the district for ensuring that we continue to move forward and be innovative uh, educators. Thank you again. Great job. And uh, I, I would just like to add that uh, we're very proud of our staff and the vision uh, from the beginning of this program back in really 2015. Uh, and we've grown the program every year. Uh, this past year we took a giant leap forward uh, after COVID uh, with some staffing changes and bringing in a new technology teacher. And Jeff, thanks for mentioning that. 
uh, because that was uh, a very important factor in getting the high school program moving forward. So uh, to follow up on Mr. Flanagan's comments about what's next, uh, we are in the process of planning, uh, working with architects and coming up with different designs for the high school maker space. And we're uh, hopeful that next month we will be able to come back to the board and bring some design ideas, design proposals, and uh, ask the board for their support to move forward. Uh, if everything works as we have planned it, uh, we are hoping that we will be in this new maker space next year around this time. Excellent. And I just want to thank the board for making this all possible and for your support and uh, your many years of support for this program. So thank you. Okay. Thank you to everyone. That's an amazing presentation. And that'll bring us to our first public comment section of tonight's meeting. If there's anyone in the public who has any comments or questions. Oh, come on down. Please state your name at the podium. <coughs> How you doing? Everyone, I don't have any questions per se. Um, I do want to say thank you. Um, this was a long time coming for the STEM program. I mean, my son waited for this forever. Mm -hmm. And to know that now our children don't have to go outside the community to get the education that they need to um, put them out there in this world. Because we all know moving forward, everything is technology. Nothing is you know, handwriting, so this is amazing. I mean, my son went to um, ID Tech for a few years just to get what you guys are bringing in, so that's awesome. And to know that it's starting in the elementary school and that it's far as young as kindergarten, that's amazing. And kudos to you guys, and kudos to the Board of Education for supporting this and supporting so much in all the years that I've been in this district. You guys worked so hard and done so much for everyone, inside, outside the community, all that you guys can do. And the PTSA, I'm oh, oh, sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Julie Miller-Truth, I'm the president of the PTSA. Um, but I pretty much know everybody here, so that's fine. <laughs> anyway, we just wanna say thank you for everything. Thank you for your support and we recognize everything that you do, and we are grateful for everything that you do. And um, we just have a little something to say thank you. To show oh, that's thank unnecessary. You. <laughs> thank you. Just a little something to thank say you. thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Julie. We should do that every public comment section. That would be great. <laughs> yes, and we appreciate the PTSA and the PTA for all the hard work. Uh, it's those groups that keep everyone churning and burning and keeping the attention on our students, and that's what matters. And it always has in Chester. Uh, that'll bring us to tonight's consent agenda. I was, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, round table. I, I've been doing this whole meeting without my glasses. So I think that's pretty good. So that'll bring us to round table. And we'll start with Mr. Petrolak. Okay, uh, tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I've asked Mr. Brennan to uh, share some information with the board about how the district is planning to use some of the American Rescue Plan funds uh, that have been allocated for Chester. So I'll ask Mr. Brennan to provide some of that information at this time. Thank you, sir. Now I just want the board, the community here, and, and everybody watching at home to sort of jump in your time machine and go back to late April <laughs> when we were finishing up the budget and I was very uh, excited to report to you that we had an allocation of just under one and a half million dollars allocated to Chester schools from the American Rescue Plan. 
Well, last week we got the final guidelines and, and regulations on, on how we can and cannot use the funds, how we apply for the funds, and what program targets that were allocated. So if you've got your fingers out, you're going to need a second hand to figure out how many months were in between there. So the first requirement is that we have engagement, meaningful engagement with the stakeholders and consult with them. So tonight I want to sort of do this as a kickoff, and I know that Mr. Petrolak has planned for a, a follow-up next board meeting to get and, and have that discussion and that feedback from the community and from the stakeholders, both on the spending plan as is required in, in this grant, as well as revised revisions and updates to our reopening plan so that we can make sure we continue to follow the best guidance and have a safe open school for all of the students. And that is also a requirement of this new grant. So we're going to be combining the two discussions because they're com perfectly linked together. And just to give you an idea that the $1.46 million, when it was finally outlaid to the districts, it was not a single grant. So it turns out that it was four separate grant applications with four separate, separate requirements and goals. The first is the largest, that's the direct federal allocation of 762,000. That one is for a number of COVID related programs as well as learning loss. Specifically learning loss, that grant has a requirement to use a minimum of 20% of the funding for, to address the learning loss from the COVID shutdowns. The next is what's called the 1% summer enrichment, and that has to be used for summer programs. The next is a 1% after school program, and that has to be focused to after school. And then the final is what's called a 5%, that's $500,000 for learning loss. So each of these categories have a specific funding amount and a specific targeted use. So we've put together a draft, a very rough draft that we want to use to guide the discussion and get the feedback from the stakeholders to use this money for direct services to the students. And that's really been a big focus of all of our grant applications. And, and when I say application, I don't just mean the paper application, but how we apply the grant to what it is we do on a day-to-day -day basis here. So we were looking to provide for three summer school teachers over the next three years. We were looking to provide for two after school teachers over the next three years. And again, let, let me just go back for a second. These grants are not like any other federal grants that have a annual budget. This amount is for the period of March 13th, 2020, all the way until October 31st of 2024. So this is not a one-year grant, it's a four-and-a-half-year grant. So we've got to try to make sure that, that we address the needs. And we know that these needs are there, and we know that they're not going to go away overnight. So we're looking to bring this out a number of years to get the maximum impact to the students. Uh, we're looking for two AIS teachers over the next two years. And again, these positions may be funded directly from the federal government, but they may have also been considered in our budget talks previously. So we're going to continue to monitor this through that process and allocate those staff members to this if need be, or hire new if they don't exist currently. And also we're looking for one FTE of math teacher, one FTE of a K-6 teacher, two special education teachers, counselor and another half time of social worker would basically add up to this total allocation. That was our, our draft, our, our thumbnail of what the needs are and how we can best use this to achieve those needs. And Ms. Petrak, I don't know if there's anything I've skipped there, but. No, I, I just wanted to add uh, that the staff numbers that Mr. Brennan mentioned are uh, 
those staffing positions that will be funded by the grant. Mm -hmm. There may be additional AIS teachers or summer school teachers that will be funded by the district. So uh, if he yes. mentioned two positions, that doesn't mean we're fixed on two positions. It means two will be funded by the federal grant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bremen. You have more? Uh, and I have another item for a round table, and uh, my last uh, item is to recognize our school board. Last week was school board recognition week, and one of the ways that we acknowledged that was we had daily postings uh, of information about different facts about our school board and uh, what school boards do specifically. And, uh, and that was the extent of the recognition that we did last week, but we saved all the good stuff for tonight. So at this point, I'd ask that Ms. Bosch and Mr. Flanagan please uh, come to the podium. I know that there are some special presentations that uh, the schools have prepared for our board members. Good evening. Okay. Um, we just wanted to say a very special thank you uh, to the school board and I'd like to welcome our art teacher, Ms. <laughs> Dawn Ukta. Um, she has been working tirelessly with our um, students and has created a, the, I feel like the theme of tonight has been a lot about collaboration. And these are collaborative art pieces of artwork um, for each of you to display in your home or your office or wherever you like. Um, and they are grade level pieces of artwork. So on the back, it says which grade level created your piece of artwork. Very and we nice. have one for each of you. So do you want to? I'm just going to really quickly let you know and let you see all of them and which <laughs> grade level did which. So this was pre-K, our first pre-K class. Oh, um, so we got to explore <laughs> crayons and paint markers. <laughs> um, we have second graders that each contributed a flower wow. to a vase. Yeah. Our first graders used our primary colors to create some hearts with uh, paint. Our third graders got to explore a little bit with watercolors. And our fifth graders each designed a popsicle stick that we attached together for a collaborative piece. Very nice. Um, so we have kind of decided who gets switch, but we <laughs> want to switch and trade. That's also okay. Yeah. Make Mr. Passionate cry. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Those are very nice. What a great idea. Good. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> thank you. What a wonderful idea. Oh, I'm all about the hearts. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. All right. You know this is going to be at our next Zoom meeting on the fireplace. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. is really all for you guys um, we we are so appreciative uh, for everything that you do for the district um, this is only a small token of our great appreciation for you all we love it thank, so thank you. you thank you very much thank you but wait there's more you can't talk that <laughs> down Flanagan. there's more in, in addition to uh, you know and to thank you to miss Besson uh, for and the advanced foods group for this morning and this afternoon for putting together uh, a nice spread I'll be honest I, it looked really good I did want to pick in there and get some things but I didn't I kept my hands out of there um, I think it was for the school board I had to be disciplined I just wanted to once again say thank you and uh, mr. Aguilar my, my trusted assistant principal here is going to help hand out a a couple of items that you know we, we, we have for you here and uh, they they were in order but Nick Patel moved all my bags around so they, they all have name tags on them though Rolando uh, so we can trouble, we can trouble, send them trouble. down there so you know part of part of tonight's presentation was all about research the research and design process and, and what we're doing here at Chester Academy so in conjunction with Mr. Rodman and, and his students to say thank you to the Board of Education we decided to take kind of a little bit of what we were doing up there and put it together for, for something to give to everybody here and it's it's something that you can leave here most of it um, but uh, we have a, we have a couple of items here first is and you, you'll see we haven't we have a nameplate for everyone we've kind of redesigned your your board nameplates um, 
Now, what's really impressive about this, and, and, and I really have to give Jeff and his students a lot of credit, when we talk about research and design in the manufacturing process, and, and we use the laser and graver to, to create these, it's not just about pressing print on the laser and graver, laying the, the manufacturing process out and laying out the format, making sure the formats, the mathematics of the symmetry and everything is right. The students worked really hard on it. And actually, the students found themselves saying, oh, no, it would be really cool. We could add this. We could put this logo on. So we had to actually tell the students, we can do that in the future. You know, like, <laughs> there's a timeline here, and we want it. We, 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 <laughs> you know, we could keep printing all night if we needed to. Um, but the students did an awesome job, so they, so they want to keep creating things. And, and for, for the rest of our group here, too, we need to be uniform as well. So we, we, we did want to keep the board and our, our central administration with all having matching nameplates around here. Right. Mrs. O'Hara's paper nameplate, we did need to change that one there. I like uh, so that is one item. And you'll notice there is there's also another item in there as well. Um, for, for, just about, for, for just about everybody here, and Brian, I apologize, we didn't make any coasters, but we know you can make them yourself in the class there. But we, we also, uh, in Mr. Rodman's class, the students designed coasters. And you, know, you don't just get one, you need a set, and we need four, because everybody gets that to, to bring home. It was, it was noticed by our, our students and Mr. Rodman that the board generally always has a, a coffee or, or something to drink while they're, they're here at the meeting. And so we decided to, uh, to provide you with a nice coaster here, which were made through the research and design process laid out and, and sent through cool. the laser engravers. So we hope you enjoy and, and we say thank you for all that you do and, and uh, thank you to Mr. Rodman and, and his students once again for, for helping out. Great job, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for me, I can't top that. You cannot <laughs> that. Very nice, thank you everybody. Again, uh, we do love what we do. Uh, tonight is a good example of why it matters. And with that in round table, I will turn to the board. Mrs. Nagler. Um, well. Did you attend some conferences <laughs> this past week? Board business is not just for board meetings. Um, there are trainings, there are other things that go on outside of of our meetings here. So um, I'm happy to report that on the 18th of the month, um, I was able to attend the annual business meeting for the New York State School Boards Association. And while NISBA does not craft legislation, as we like to remind everyone, it's rather setting the platform for advocacy for what the state school board intends to encourage and ask of the state education department to provide to, to the districts, the local districts, what our needs are. So um, at that conference, um, at that business meeting, we adopted a number of platforms that will be the focus for NISBA this upcoming year. And the range is um, some of the typical things that you would expect um, advocacy for, for our students, um, adequate state funding for education, promotion of rigorous standards for schools, advocating for students with disabilities, supporting proposals for state uh, reimbursement of meals, um, school district voting regulations, updates and compliance with open meetings laws, revision of child safety zone statutes, um, seeking out legislative and policy changes to streamline the teacher certification process for teachers from out of state and those with previous experience, as well as a handful of other um, uh, thoughts that, that were found to be important. Um, we adopted 17 new proposals of what was important statewide. Um, that was last week. This week, um, I had the privilege of, unfortunately, our in-person uh, state school board conference was canceled this year due to the pandemic. However, they did run a virtual program. So on Monday, I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the online conference. And I have to say, the speakers that presented were phenomenal. Um, 
It was limited in scope, obviously, because it was a virtual presentation. But the focus on learning loss and how schools can best address those needs, that presenter did a wonderful job, um, Susanna Loeb. Um, there was conversation with the state ed department. There was a, um, a focus on working towards wellness, life after pandemic. You know, what does it look like to our students and their families? And what does it look like in the school buildings? How are we addressing it um, and partnering with our families and with our communities? Um, and then just a, a little bit of um, policy and governmental regulation stuff as well. Um, so it was a busy couple of days, but it's nice to see that as a local school board, we have the opportunity to make impacts in our own communities but a lot of what we are facing and we struggle with, we can work with our partners at our Orange County School Boards Association with our counterparts there, as well as at a higher level, at the state level. And we are all coming up with solutions and ways that we can best meet the needs of our students because we are not in this alone. So I am grateful for the opportunity to be able to participate on a number of different levels. So, thank you. Nicely done. Anything for Oxbow, Mr. Pesha? Uh The first Wednesday of November will be Orange County School Boards Association meeting, at uh, which time we will be discussing the seminars, meetings, presentations uh, from the New York State School Boards Association conference and our special guests will be uh, Orange County school attorneys who will be discussing local issues of interest uh, and I believe one of the topics will be the use of email and uh, electronic media and security of such instruments okay yes I did talk to Bill Boss this week um, and I believe that's still going to be a virtual meeting, right? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lisa, I know she's already sent out the uh, links. Yes. Everyone on the board should have received that. So mm -hmm. we, we'd love to see you there. Thank you, sir. Any other board members? No. How about Brian at the end? I can't see him. Yes. There he is. How are you, Brian? How was the last two weeks at the Academy? It was good. It was good. Um, just some things to go over. Tomorrow we have, or not tomorrow, Friday we have the pep rally. Uh, we'll be wearing pink to school just to support breast cancer awareness. We're really trying to push that. Um, today we had something interesting. We had the Army National Guard come over and set up a rock, rock climbing wall for the Project Adventure kids, mm -hmm. which is really interesting to see. Um, as someone who wants to apply to the Armed Forces, being able to really interact with people from the military is definitely interesting. Um, we also had some college visits come in, come in from the, in the past couple of weeks, which is really interesting. We get to go down and see them. Um, in Mr. Rodman's class, we got to go to see Oswego, which is also the school that I set up with our, with our um, class. Uh, today, we had the Safe School Advance Ambassador uh, field trip. So some of the kids who are designated to help out and really show effort in helping uh, the classmates in the school um, got to go and do that. Uh, this week we'll be doing Deck the Hole, which is where different grades get to deck, uh, um, deck, deck, decorate a specific hallway, and uh, whoever wins um, gets $200 towards their class. Okay. Uh, we had homecoming last Saturday. It was a good turnout. A lot of kids went. Um, the patio definitely helped out. Uh, a lot of the kids like it. It's a bummer for you know, us seniors having to... Uh, leave and not be able to use the patio too much, but um, it's definitely nice to have. Um, we have the engineer fair. Um, some of the kids, including myself, were able to sign up for that, so something to go into the engineering that we talked today. But mm -hmm. the school is giving us opportunities to go to engineering fairs and learn more about careers in engineering. Um, internships are starting to ramp up. We, I'm currently in the law enforcement internship. I just went there today, um, and I know 
some other, like my friend Emily Petromol is doing the teaching internship, so she gets to help out with Miss Burton. And uh, so a lot of kids are taking advantage of it, and it's a good program to have. Uh, and Miss Bredo is doing a great job with it. So, yeah. Nicely done. Nice report. And that's a nice sweatshirt you're wearing there. Thank you. <laughs> I'd be wearing it all over the place. So you were Navy. Yeah, but it would, it would say Navy on it, but still. It, I like that sweatshirt, sir. We're very proud of you. Okay, anything else for roundtable? Then we will need a motion on uh, tonight's consent agenda. I'd like to make a motion that the board approves items 5.1 through 5.11 on the consent agenda. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That brings us to our final public comment. No more from you, Julie. You're good. You're done. <laughs> but uh, again, the board would like to thank, first of all, our incredible staff, administration. Um, you make it all worthwhile every day as board members. We can't thank you enough for all the hard work that goes in. You're really the nuts and bolts of what makes this all work. So thank all of you. We appreciate every single one of you. Please pass it on to your colleagues and the staff throughout the district. And with that, I'll need a motion to adjourn. So Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that's a wrap.